Just 30 years ago, on the evening of Monday, June the 14th, 1982, Margaret Thatcher announced the end of one of the strangest episodes in post-war British history. She did so just over my shoulder here in a crowded, excited House of Commons. Talks are now in progress about the surrender of the Argentine forces on East and West Falkland. Yeah. What Thatcher formally confirmed was what by that stage the world already knew, that the Argentine garrison on the Falkland Islands had surrendered to a numerically smaller British invasion force. What the US Navy had called militarily impossible had been achieved in just 74 days by a British task force of 127 ships, 42 warplanes and 35,000 men. It had steamed 8,000 miles into a South Atlantic winter to defeat an enemy just 400 miles from its own home base. Defence analyst Robert Fox, then of the BBC, was there. Mortars firing behind me, making porridge in the morning, and said, the RSM, 4-5 commander, terrific guy, came up and said, no, you haven't got any time for that. They're surrendering, we're going in. And we started down the track, and it was like a Nash painting, leaden sky, snow on the ground, and I was 10 metres behind the famous, the iconic photograph of the Marine, his pack, and the Union Jack. June the 14th was a pretty boisterous evening, in contrast to weeks of strain and tension as diplomacy went wrong, ships were sunk, lives lost on both sides. As The Guardian's then sketch writer, I was in the Commons Press Gallery the night of the surrender, as I had been on the day it started, Friday, April the 2nd. That day, the boot was on the other foot. It was a humiliating day for Britain, as ministers denied what Buenos Aires had been telling the world for hours, that troops belonging to the junta, led by General Leopoldo Galtieri, had finally made good their threat to retake what they regard as Las Malvinas. Or as Rex Hunt, the British governor in Port Stanley, put it rather more succinctly, as the troops came up the beach, it looks as if the buggers really mean it. Bernard Ingham was Mrs Thatcher's number 10 press secretary. John Knott came along to tell Margaret Thatcher that the Argentinian fleet had set sail, and he then informed her that the view of the Ministry of Defence was that if the islands were taken, they could not be recovered. Well, I mean, she put on a passable imitation of um, that chap who says, I could not believe it. For Mrs Thatcher, not yet the world figure she became, it all meant potential disaster. Foreign Office, MOD, they were both against reconquest, but she was lucky. In Admiral Sir Henry Leach, head of the Navy, she found a kindred can-do spirit. Can we take the islands back? Yes, we can, said Leach. Cecil Parkinson was the distinctly civilian Tory party chairman, a rising Thatcherite star, soon to find himself sitting with the generals and admirals in Thatcher's war cabinet. A cabinet met on the Friday evening, and Margaret went round the table asking each member of the cabinet for their opinion. And only one member of the cabinet, John Biffin, said, we can't take them back, let's negotiate. The rest all said, uh, following Henry Leach's assurance, let's send the task force to sea. And with that, the task force sailed within days. Thatcher and the Ministry of Defence had shown they meant business. But as the conflict escalated and diplomacy gave way to overt acts of war, then came the entire period's most controversial decision. Cecil Parkinson was there. The sinking of the Belgrano was a critical moment because the Belgrano had the capacity to sink a carrier and its orders were to sink a carrier. That's why it was at sea. 
the net result was many more lives were lost than we expected to have lost. And uh, we took no pleasure in that. The Sun might famously have proclaimed gotcha, but 368 lives had been lost, and in the safety of the commons, we suddenly knew it was all going to be serious. Sure enough, two days later, May the 4th, the destroyer Sheffield was struck by an Exocet missile from an Argentine fighter and later sank. The weekend before the task force landing, things became really tense. I can remember Max Hastings at a lunch just bending a fork like that. Everybody, I mean, the, the, the hacks as much as anybody, just wanted to get on with it. The perilous landings duly began on May 21st, After the sinking of the Atlantic conveyor, mistaken for a carrier but actually carrying 16 Chinook helicopters, the soldiers would have to march across the bleak, treeless islands. They called it yomping. When the collapse came, after UK forces had captured the strategic hills overlooking Stanley during fierce fighting, it came suddenly. There would be no dramatic last stand for General Mendoza in Port Stanley, or for his tired, cold, demoralised and mostly conscript army. Unlike some later wars, there was a pretty solid British consensus that this one had been worth fighting. There had been unprovoked aggression by a fairly nasty regime, which paid the price of failure. Argentina got its democracy back, but Mrs. Thatcher benefited too, of course. I'd been going abroad with ministers from 1970, and frankly, during the 70s, we were clapped out. We were a damn nuisance. They didn't want to know. Once she demonstrated a resolution over the economy and the Falklands, everybody wanted to talk to her. Today's armed forces, bloodied and battered, its troop numbers slashed to save money, its equipment budgets eviscerated. If the Argentine sabre-rattling now going on suddenly turned nasty, they simply couldn't take the Falklands back again as they did last time. On the other hand, that's what they said last time too. <laughs> 